afternoon, everybody from the very, very warm country or geography of Dubai. My name is Ben Ibrahim, and it's a pleasure to be your master of ceremonies and moderator for this whole week on behalf of Cradle Funds in Erinburghard. The last two days have been extremely, extremely inspirational and also educational for all, everybody out there. The mandate of Cradle is to really, really connect with the startups and really connect the ecosystem together to move forward, not just from business to business within Malaysia, but business to business from Malaysia to all around the world. We live in that climate right now. As we always say in Malaysia, let's make our business big, not just domestically, but over the sea on the international scale as well. So today we've got, well, very, very shortly, we've got a very good topic called Malaysia, the gateway to ASEAN. So for this particular session, I've take, I'm putting on my Master of Ceremonies hat on. But before I introduce our panel and our speaker, or our speaker, our moderator for this session, who will introduce the speakers, I just want to just a few housekeeping uh, and announcements that if you could just keep following us on the Cradle Fund Facebook, or leave your comments there, leave some questions there. We'll try to answer it as much as possible. Don't forget, you, I'm talking to everybody around the world and in Malaysia that we want your feedback. We want to hear your views. We want to hear your questions because this is what Dubai Expo 2020 is all about, connecting the conversations to grow the ecosystem. So please, your views and opinions and questions are very, very much respected and will be highlighted as best as we can. So like I said, a topic, Malaysia, the gateway to ASEAN. Now, just I want to give you a heads up and a little bit of positive warning because this session is going to be extremely comical informative and well comical as well because the speakers will look at the brighter side of the business investment side and the business side and also how Malaysia is such a potential to the gateway if you want to do business in the Southeast Asian region but I will just introduce the moderator right now and that is Mr. Sharil Anas Hassan Aziz who is from MathCap that's right he is the chief executive officer and he's been there since January 2015 bringing him with him over 20 years of extensive investment and funding raising experience, having previously worked in the Employment Employees Provident Fund, known as EPF Malaysia, and Malaysia Technology Development Corporation, MTDC, and Unit Najib Muputra, also known as Taraju, just to name a few. He's got a very, very great CV. You know, Shara's focus in MathCap included working on establishing more corporate funds on funds and partnership. The aim is to generate more funds available in the ecosystem for investment purposes specifically targeted for technology companies. So Sharil also works on various initiatives and projects from the CEO's office. Sharil is a graduate of the International Islamic University Kuala Lumpur, a degree in economics. Now he's all about fund, F-U-N-D, but he's all about fun, F-U-N as well. So without further ado, Sharil, enjoy this very wonderful, comical and informative session. Please, you know, inspire our audience with this session. Over to you, sir. Okay, thank you, man. And a very good afternoon, everyone. Assalamualaikum. A very good late evening. Oh, sorry, late, late afternoon in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, yeah, I think before we start, uh, we are, I think we are very, 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 very privileged to have with us two of the early believers in Qasem. One of our first, oh, sorry, the first unicorn of Malaysia. Yay! <laughs> Okay, the, I think Kylie was the first one to, you know, to bring in custom in, into the, the portfolio and then double down with our other funds. Actually, five, five of our funds, actually, uh, in, in the early stage. But then again, this is all about Malaysia, Southeast Asia. And I would like to introduce Kylie first. Kylie, uh, an entrepreneur, uh, US-based, Silicon Valley from the north. Uh, he's coming back. So he's already back in Malaysia. Headquartered in Kuala Lumpur. Tom as well, in the north, but the other side of the world, from China, 2002. I think uh, because the session is only what, one hour, I think uh, people can always Google you guys, can always check your LinkedIn. Uh, I think, the, I think the, the most important part is Southeast Asia. Okay, back in early 2010, you know, when Silicon Valley and China, you know, uh, actually flourishing in terms of startups, why in the world are you going to Malaysia? What were you thinking at that point of time? Uh, maybe uh, Tom first, from, from, from the China perspective, why Southeast Asia and why Malaysia for that matter? 
What about you, Tom? Well, thank you, Shereel. And it's a, my great pleasure and, and privilege, again, to be on a panel with Kylie here, moderated by the highly esteemed Shereel. So uh, again, I'm delighted. And I thank, again, all the sponsors. Uh, you can see uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the logos behind me. Thank you all for having me. I think, uh, Shereel, the, 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 the easy answer to that is um, at Gobi, we follow the data. So we were investing in a lot of Chinese startups, and we saw that with very little uh, marketing or active effort, they were picking up a lot of clients in Southeast Asia. So we had a company called Tunio that was in the travel space, right? All the Chinese tourists were, were coming to Southeast Asia. And we're like, wow, you're getting more than like 33% uh, of your revenue from Southeast Asia. And, and what are we doing there? And, and the senior management at Tunio said, we're not doing anything. And we said, man, maybe we should be doing more. Let's find out what's going on. We had a company called Camera 360. And it turns out more than of their 800 million users at the time, 400 million were in Southeast Asia. And I asked the senior management team, I said, what are we doing special in Southeast Asia? And they said, nothing. They've never even been. Oh. And so we were like, hey, there's something going on. So the data was telling us that there was this interconnectivity uh, with China and Southeast Asia. And so like any other good VC, and I'm sure Kylie would agree, uh, Nothing VCs can do better than to name trends. So we wanted to connect Northeast Asia with Southeast Asia, but you need a catchy name. So we called it Crouching Panda Hidden Tapir. And that became our strategy, connecting Northeast Asia with Southeast Asia. And uh, that journey kind of started early. And the reason why we chose Malaysia is because I think, again, I've said this before, we think Malaysia is a super connector. It connects you to five amazing markets, right? The first one is Malaysia can connect you to Indonesia, right? Similar language, similar kind of culture, behavioral uh, patterns. So that's one. Malaysia is very diverse. It has a thriving Indian Malaysian community. From Malaysia, you can connect to India. Same applies to the Chinese, Malaysian Chinese community. The Malaysian Chinese speak great English and Mandarin and Cantonese. From Malaysia, you can connect to China. Because Malaysia was part of the British Commonwealth, they use British uh, common law. Fantastic English levels. You can connect to the broader Western markets. And finally, as we, you can see now, right, Malaysia, because it's a Muslim country, can connect to this larger global Islamic economy. And, and we've called that Takwa Tech. And so what other place in the world can you find uh, a, a super connector that connects to these five opportunities? And he, these are five of the biggest opportunities in the world. And so that's why, Sharil. Hey, Tom Ken. Thanks, man. Uh, Kylie? Well named. Yeah, uh, I think to respond to your question about like in the early days, why 500 Global... Uh, formerly known as 500 Startups, right? 500 Global um, decided to expand our strategy to go quite deep in the Southeast Asia. There's a personal reason and a professional reason. So let's begin with the uh, personal one. Um, a lot of my entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial career has been, had been built out of Southeast Asia, specifically in Malaysia. Just growing up in Malaysia myself um, and looking from like the inside out, like I saw the degree of talent that was available in Southeast Asia, specifically in Malaysia. And also I saw the success that could be created very quickly when the market is nascent. You almost have this arbitrage opportunity where the market is so ready and hungry to make things happen. But a lot of the big businesses have not been built yet. So from an entrepreneurial perspective, um, after I built and sold uh, my companies, um, traveling to Silicon Valley to learn more about the different business models there, I realized that there's so many business models that would become huge companies and I would need multiple lifetimes to actually get it done myself. So the best way to actually activate all of that is venture capital.
students with the most activity right now. And we have a blast of a time having the Southeast Asia connection and the Middle Eastern connection. It's, it's, it's amazing. Like they, there's a lot of shared values, again, and there's a lot of shared vision. And so for today, I think for the audience who are from Malaysia or, in, or, or from other parts of the world, what's your vision? What are your values? You know, we're here to play long-term games with long-term people. And if we want to create something together, we can, we can do it together. And it, it's going to be a lot of fun and we're going to see a lot of success. So I hope for this experience together here today to be like a starting point to start those conversations, if you will. Um, yeah, so happy to be here. And thank you so much for having, having us here today with you as well. Okay, guys, thanks for your insights of why you, come, why you were coming to Malaysia last time. So what next after Kasem? I think the, the ministers already put a challenge to everyone, especially MEFCAP, <laughs> to, have another, to have another five unicorns. And Tom was saying, hey, we can, we, we can have it 10. So, <laughs> so where, where would they come from, Tom? And maybe Kylie as well, uh, the, the unicorn. Uh, the unicorn from Malaysia. Tom, please. Well, I think again, I, I, I think, you know, when, 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 when we looked at our own, I mean, we feel pretty confident. We, we've got another four in the making right now. You know, they're, they're baby unicorns, they're ready. And I'm sure Kylie's got a bunch as well. And I think, again, that's what makes, I think, Malaysia so very exciting. I think Malaysian entrepreneurs are fantastic at regionalizing. You know, it's, it's interesting. Malaysia, in my mind, is kind of, you know, it's kind of in between Singapore and Indonesia, right? It's bigger than Singapore. So you can actually have a home market to grow out of and, and defend, right? And, and get scale. But at the same time, you have to go outside because it's not as big as Indonesia. So I think M Malaysia by that, it, it almost forces the entrepreneurs to have to regionalize, but they can get critical mass first. And, and, and so when, when I look at some, again, I don't want to put pressure on our entrepreneurs, but if I had to name a couple, I think the next unicorns coming out will be companies like an Aerodyne, right? That I think uh, was also a guest speaker maybe a, a day earlier. Uh, and then I think in another company in our portfolio very high on is Easy Parcel. And they came out of uh, Penang. Uh, and they are doing fantastic. Uh, they're beneficiary a lot of the e-commerce trends. And Clarence is one of the best operators I've seen. Uh, and so, you know, that's just, just, just off the top of my head. I think those are, again, companies in the pipeline from Malaysia that I think are on the track. Um, but again, I think Sharil, and I, I noticed when you said that, you kind of hesitated a bit because, look, we've all been doing this a long time. You don't want to put unnecessary pressure on the entrepreneurs. You got to take it at, they got to take it at their pace. Uh, there's going to be mistakes along the way, and that's why I think, when they bring on experienced investors like myself and Kylie, hopefully they won't have to make the same mistakes that we've already learned. They can make new ones, but at least we can, you know, shortcut some of that. Uh, and that, that's kind of our job. And, and that's the other thing I'm really pleased about is, you, you know, Malaysia is now building out also a critical mass in the venture capital community. Uh, and, and that's very beneficial to the entire ecosystem. Okay, Kylie. You know, you yeah, Aerodyne and Easy Parcel from you. Yeah, I mean those are great companies. Uh, we're pleased to co -invest, have co-invested with many other uh, VCs in Aerodyne as well, right? Including Tom. So I think that's like one of the near uh, easy wins. And I'll tell you about one that I'm super excited about right now, um, Storehub. So Toast just uh, did their twenty billion dollar IPO. Toast has forty thousand stores. Storehub has fourteen thousand stores. And so you just look at the Again, the, Nick, the delta between what Storehub is valued at today, which is their up and coming, versus what they possibly can achieve. Now, what's, so I think for companies like that, they're also part of a larger economic recovery story, similar to how the Carson um, is driven by the, chain, the structural changes and evolutions of the economy. The same thing with all the restaurants in all of Southeast Asia. They're a market leader in three countries, and they are delivering the kind of unit economics which is superior to many of the comparables over, all over the world. So that's just one of many other kinds of stories which, uh, you know, sometimes you don't hear it as the big name, right? It's not uh, what I call a blockbuster hit, right? Like everyone's watched a movie. Sometimes you, you get sleeper hits, right? You know, they're quietly working. They're chugging along, right? They don't need much capital. They don't raise much money so nobody hears about them as much. 
But when they hit the box office, you can make almost as much money as Blockbuster and yeah. definitely a much larger return for investors. There are so many, I, and I'm going to use like this time to talk about them all because there's so many resting within a lot of the portfolios, which I'm laying. Uh, I'll name one more. It's called MHub. Like those folks are plugging it away. They, they have linked the kind of end-to-end dynamics that Carson had to do. And because Carson linked every single piece of the puzzle up end-to-end, that's why they can have transactions across buying and selling cars digitized. Like MHub is just like a click away from really activating property transactions to go end-to-end as well. And from that as a platform to let the fintech layer on top of it, it's just going to be crazy. So I'm really pleased with a lot of the Malaysian talent because of, let me pop it out to a larger trend, right? A lot of Middle Eastern companies or international companies looking to do business in Malaysia, you have to understand one thing about Malaysians. There are Malaysians everywhere. There are Malaysians in Singapore. There's Malaysians in Silicon Valley. There's Mil- you know, Malaysians all over China. But you, some of you don't know. Like, because they are so internationalized and internationally integrated, their accents are so vague. Like, where is this person from? I don't know, right? So it, 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 it's hard to tell, but they're there. So the global network of, 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 of Malaysians operating companies and driving companies, they're, they're all in that fabric. Bringing it towards tech and startups, a lot of the unicorns in Southeast Asia are literally operated by Malaysians. You know, I, all, the, all the unicorns you can name from the, the largest, super like large ones like C-Limited, a whole ton of Malaysian stack in there. Uh, Grab, a lot of the senior leadership team members, they're built out of Malaysian and Malaysian DNA. And this is also built off the back of multiple generations of Job Street, you know, iProperty, right? And all these companies, all these operators. So the Malaysian operator DNA is so strong. And a lot of that operator DNA is translating itself to new startups as well. Even big regional companies like Carousel, one of the founders is from Ipo. His name is Lucas, Malaysian, right? So Malaysia is the ultimate sleeper hit of talent and opportunity. And for a lot of the countries that are tuning into this, like to be able to take advantage of that before anybody else is going to give you such a leapfrog in what you want to achieve, right? So I really would invite closer investigation of what's possible. Okay, we talk a lot about uh, entrepreneurs in Malaysia, you know, talent and whatnot. Coming back to funding, okay, actually, how do you want to entice these corporate people, especially in Malaysia, to actually put in money into this risk capital and create more unicorns and make VC vibrant as per the Silicon Valley? Maybe uh, Tom could, uh, could, could answer that because you have the uh, liberty to work with Sunway. Well, look, I think, uh, you know, if, if, if COVID did not finally convince you that VC is the right asset class to be in, I, I don't know what will, right? I think Kylie and I, we've been singing on, we've been singing the same song. I mean, a lot of people have been like, oh, VC, it's too risky. You know, I want to go into safe, tangible assets. And I know this is uh, particularly true, I, I, I think, in Southeast Asia and, and also in the Middle East, where, you know, people... They want to invest into things they can touch and feel. And so most often, uh, you know, VC is viewed as very risky, longer holding periods. But, you know, if you look at what's happened over the last two years, uh, it turned out the, the assets that you thought were less risky, property, right, uh, owning restaurants, physical schools, retail department stores, right, uh, and when you think back, what were the sectors that got hit? Uh, hotels, right? Those were the physical asset heavy industries were the ones that got hit. So you didn't want to be owning commercial uh, real estate. You wanted to be in remote working tools, right? You wanted to be in SaaS companies. You didn't want to own a private school. You wanted to be in online education. You didn't want to own the physical grocery stores or supermarkets. You wanted to be in online grocery delivery. And you didn't want to be in big restaurant chains. You wanted to be in food delivery, right? The pandemic has shown that the digital transformation we've been talking about is real. It's not going away. And that's why we're seeing all of a sudden a mind shift. Every corporation in the world needs to have a venture capital strategy. And if the pandemic hasn't convinced you to do that, I don't know what will. So we're starting to see the beginning. 
right? The, the, the really smart companies that are realizing that, my God, if I don't, if I don't get along with this digital transformation, I'm going to get left behind. I think to build on uh, Tom, Tom, like yeah. that is a, that is very convincing articulation. Uh, and it's so interesting because uh, although you and I have been singing the same song for a long time, like the, the corporations, as well as the funds, the institutional funds who acted on it, they're laughing to the bank right now because it, it's, it's, they've got a head start. And let's just compare to some other countries. Like in Thailand, like so, such a big part of the ecosystem of venture capital in Thailand is corporate funded and family funded. You know, and they, they, are, they are like savvy and they are sophisticated because they got a head start. So I think the idea to invite and also to give a head nod to a lot of the corporations in Malaysia who have gotten the head start, like really, like so much respect to them. Like when we first engaged with Petronas in um, about four years ago, like it was like, I didn't know what to expect, right? They're like a very large company. They're one of the top 500 largest corporations in the whole world. But for them and the way, the ferocity that they went to develop their venture strategy, to launch accelerators with us, to invest in our funds, to co-invest in our portfolio companies. Like it's a concerted effort and it's like driven by the people who work in Petronas. So I'm just really proud of a lot of the Petronas folks because they have innovation DNA. They're like original deep tech, you know? And, I, and, I, and it's a really good, uh, how you say, parallel to the conversations here we have with the Middle East. Any nation which depends on oil right now has a pretty uncertain future that they have to hedge against. And to make this really personal, like my dad was an oil and gas. Like I grew up not really understanding what he did. You know, he worked for Petronas. Then eventually like he worked for another oil and gas company. I never understood like why he's so excited about oil and gas. But later when I got into tech, I realized that oil and gas was the boom industry of that era. And so my dad and I were actually more similar than we thought. And now today we're like so close. We have so much conversation because we understand each other on that level. But what's super interesting about that is that's the kind of conversation that the Middle East, that Malaysia and other oil dependent nations and, and corporations in oil and gas, they need to have too. They need to understand that tech is no different from oil and gas. You're drilling out for gold, you're drilling out for different sites to see whether it is, there's oil there, right? And you want to see if you strike oil. You're not gonna, you're not gonna like strike, you're gonna just go mine one place in the ocean to get your oil. You're gonna have to have a portfolio strategy, right? You're gonna have a larger portfolio of companies that to produce the new oil in the intangible economy. So I think bringing, connecting all these dots together, like I, I have so much respect for Petronas and kind of partnership because we're back with the second accelerator program. And this time we back, so uh, kudos to Rafiza as well because she spent time at Simon Darby. Simon Darby's part as a partner of that accelerator program. It's called the Petronas Future Tech Accelerator. It's a great program. A lot of great companies coming out of it. So stay tuned for that one. Um, there are many, many more corporations in Malaysia as well. Some of them don't want to be very public about the venture strategy, but we've benefited from a lot of like Asian family owned corporations, which are Malaysian that we can't name publicly, but they have really got the head start and they've executed with a lot of velocity. And now they're laughing to the bank, right? Cause they know they're securing their future proofing their legacy. I would invite any corporation listening to this, just get that start, just get the head start right now. It's you're going to play the long game. Don't see it as like an overnight transformation. Play the long game. Shared values, shared vision, long-term games with long-term people. Get that hit start. Oh, man. Cool, man. It's, it's deep, man. It's deep. But then again, I think the hype now is when we talk about uh, VCs and entrepreneurs and business, it's all about uh, future proofing, right? So what, is, what can you actually say to the people or, or to the folks that are listening to us? in terms of future, future proof the business, especially by having all the, especially on the sovereign, sovereign West Fund, um, putting money into VC. Um, maybe I'll, I'll take the first one at this, right? So, I mean, sovereign wealth funds is one thing. Like we deal with, so, like we have LPs for our sovereign wealth funds. We have LPs for pensions, you know, and just understanding um, the, the concerns that each and every one of them have, each, each of them, they're on a transformation journey of their own, right? Some of them got in a head start a long time ago. Some of them are very, very sophisticated right now. Um, and some of them are just getting their feet wet. So the most important thing is just understand where you are and where all your stakeholders are. 
and bring them on that journey. We had pensions like engaging with us for six years before they've invested. You know, it's, it's a journey to take. We've got sovereigns like three years of getting to know each other before they invest. But we also have some sovereigns within two months of engagement, they cut very large checks into our funds. And so I would invite anyone who represents a financial institution or sovereign is that it's something that you can learn from, from other sovereigns and other pension funds and other endowments. There are a lot of other financial institutions that peers that you can learn from. They've done it. They've executed so well. Like watch how they move through the journey, surround yourself with different partners who can take you on their journey, who are in it for the long-term gain, who, who want to work with you across two or three decades to see a transformation through. Long-term games, long-term people. You got to start playing. Don't be out of the game. <laughs> okay, Tom, over to you. Yeah, no, I, I think Kylie said that so well. Uh, it, it just, uh, I, you know, I'm, I can only add by just saying, and you know, I think earlier, you know, you talked about oil and gas. And, and I think it's very important for all the sovereign wealth funds, particularly in the, I think in the Middle East and in, in, in resource rich nations like Malaysia, you, you know, when you think about it, you know, data is the new oil, right? It, it, it is, it is the, the new, it's a natural resource. You have to think about it that way. And here's the great thing about, about data. You know what? It's unlimited. Every country can get access to it. So it's not based off of your, you know, your, your geographical circumstance. And so that's why every country can, can participate in this kind of digital transformation. And, and here's what I'd also argue. Most you know, countries' governments have always looked at when they kind of do their own audit of, of what is my country good at, my competitive advantage, right? It's uh, my access to water, natural resources, blah, blah, blah. Here's another big natural resource, ready? Your entrepreneurs, they're your greatest natural resource. So when you're investing in your own entrepreneurs in your country, they may create entire industries, but you got to take that chance. Because if you don't, if you, you as a sovereign wealth fund don't even do it in your own country, I mean, you can't expect anybody from the outside to do it. And again, I think Kylie and I have visited many countries. And that's why, again, it, it, it is a toolkit. VC is a toolkit for every country to unlock the entrepreneurial energy within that country and get people involved in solving problems. But again, it takes, you know, it takes that kickstart. You cannot depend on Silicon Valley to ride to the rescue. Most of these guys don't even know where a lot of these countries are. And again, that's why I'm very, when I saw, and again, I see this in the Middle East and I see this in Malaysia, the government involvement coming in, right? Creating the environment to attract, right? Private, the public private partnership that we talk about. These are indicators of success and indicators of an ecosystem that start to grow organically. And in fact, that's what I would say Kylie and I are doing, right? In a sense, Kylie, we're, we're, we build out ecosystems. Right. And then these ecosystems are self-sustaining. And the more players you have, the stronger the ecosystem becomes. And, and it's, it's a very diverse, uh, inclusive ecosystem that can withstand shocks. So I love what Kylie's saying, 20, 30 year mindset. I mean, you think about Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley has been around for 40 years. Yeah. Right. People forget that. Yeah. And they're like, oh, why can't we be like Silicon Valley? You know what? Well, listen, you got to go through four cycles. You know, everybody always asks like, oh, Tom, you know, um, you know, everybody says it's one in 10. I bake 10 cookies. Aren't I supposed to have one cookie that comes out great? And I'm like, yes. But what happens if you bake the first tray? They all fail. The second tray, sometimes it's the fourth tray of cookies. Do you have the do you have the staying power to go through that? And then you know what? Sometimes it's on that last batch of cookies. You get four of them. The average out, it's one out of 10. But my God, if you didn't bake that fourth tray, you don't get the one out of 10. You gave up on tray two. You can't give up. This is a long-term game, as Kylie is saying, right? And here's the beautiful thing. Even when VC fails, 
the experience, the, 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 the know-how that's, that, that, that's pushed down through the workforce, right? The human capital, it accumulates and manifests itself in other ways. Lessons learned by somebody in a failed startup could become the keys to success in the next company. But you got to invest into it. Okay, coming back into, you know, you guys are true philosophers, man. <laughs> coming back... <laughs> Okay, but you know, into... Cheryl, before we jump to the next question, though, I, I, okay, I think okay. it's important to recognize the, how important Tom's point is uh, in terms of just getting started on the games. And also because there may be some international audience to, uh, tuning in, uh, I think to connect those dots, um, the game takes time, but the inflection point that we're at right now, uh, this game is also about to speed up. Why? Because there are a lot more countries getting involved in the game. Right. If let's say we just take Malaysia for example, if Malaysian funds and Malaysian government directed funds don't double down now, somebody else is going to own that stack. Somebody is so, you built the whole ecosystem. Somebody else is going to own the fruits of that ecosystem. So, and the same thing when we talk about like say uh, Middle East and Malaysia or any other kind of global corporation, having that shared vision and having financial ownership of it. It's even more important, right? You don't want to build a shared vision and put all the money in, and you know, it's like you're doing all the cookie baking, and somebody else eats all the cookies. You know what I mean? Like it's, <laughs> right? It's like, you know, we we need to financialize our strategy to make a return on investment. So the first topic that Tom and I are talking about is we got to make the investment, but you got to structure the way you get these returns. Now, sometimes it takes a long time, but again, back to Tom and the cookie, <laughs> fantastic cookie metaphor over there. Like we were so fortunate, we had no idea how Southeast Asia would perform. We made 21 investments in 2014. We started in July. By December, we did 21 investments. Six unicorns came from that first batch. If you were to tell me, if we had to rewind in 2014 and say, Kylie, like you and 500 Global, like just invest in 20 companies. Let's see if you're going to have a cookie come out. I, I'm going to tell you that I don't know. I don't know if South Asia is going to get a unicorn. I have no idea. Like, we could figure it out, right? Well, maybe we have one. Out of 100 investments, maybe we have one. So now we've got six out of 21. What are we going to do now? So now we're analyzing 2015. Okay, we already have one unicorn in there. Like, who else is going to be unicorn, right? These things will happen so fast. Today, you know, this year, when we began the year, there was only 600 unicorns in the world. Right now, there are 980 unicorns right now. At this date, and the year's not even done. There's a massive acceleration of technological advancement, fundamentally, where each advancement of technology feeds another one. You're not going to get a smartphone unless you have 20 other in, 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 in technologies. These technologies are compounding. When you add that to the compounding quickness of how talent infuses into this to use the technology, and you compound it at the rate of financialization of this game, where so many investors, corporates, governments, VCs, international funds, you know, it, it, all the international funds are just going global right now. And, and you know, we're very grateful at Fundra Global. We got that hit start because we saw this is going to be a long-term game. But all of that has compounding effect. So what would used to take 40 years for Silicon Valley, like India has achieved in like 10, 20 years, right? And, I, and what, we, what MapCap has done, right, over the past 15 years of seeding VCs from the get-go, that's like a crazy smart strategy. I don't know who thought about it. I know, Charles, maybe you can answer it for us. But because like now MapCap is reaping those awards. So now we've hit the inflection point where the compounding effect is kicking up. Double down now. Anything that you're doing, you see it works, you just double down right now. Because once the compounding effect takes in, you're on that roller coaster. I don't, I don't want anyone to be too late. That, that's all. You know what I mean? I don't want anyone to look back 10 years from now and say, oh, I wish we put a bit more money in that. You know what I mean? <laughs> the signs are clear, right? If it's not COVID, just look at all the other data, right? The signs are clear enough for all of us. Sorry, sorry, okay, I interrupted I, you. Uh, okay, okay. I don't want to give the mic to you, man. Okay, <laughs> uh, okay, guys. Okay, folks. I think one of the last issues, and it is very important that uh, VCs is actually quite new in this part of the in, in this part of the world, and it may not it may not be an asset class, you know, to to, to the likings of the corporate sovereign wealth fund, uh, you know, uh, or other institutional investors. Actually, how do you want to educate them to make VC as one of the asset class? And, and then just like Kylie and both of you say, were saying, 
this is this is the time not not to double down but actually to just to initiate some part of your you know your capital into this kind of risk capital uh, for 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 Malaysia especially you want me to go first on that Kylie no oh, I, I I I you go go right ahead my friend all right well this is what I got to say for that ready which is I think you know, I think we all feel it. The world is definitely changing. And I think what was viewed as risky is less risky. And what was less risky is more risky. What do I mean by that? You talk to any sovereign wealth fund in Asia and they say, oh, you know, I got to I have to generate returns and I need safe investments. I'm going to invest into U.S. treasuries or buy real estate on Park Avenue. I mean, why, you know, if you, were, if you were to ask me, you know, in the past when people talk about political risk, they looked at Southeast Asia and they said, oh, it's very risky. I'd make an argument now is when you look at political risk right now, is the U.S. that much uh, politically uh, more stable than the other countries now? Uh, is, uh, and, and what's wonderful about what Kylie's saying is, you know, the VC activity is going global. The anomaly over the last 40 years is not that, you know, oh, there's VC activity all over the world. The anomaly over the last 40 years that all innovation was concentrated in Silicon Valley. How crazy is that? And Silicon Valley is always going to be amazing. But what I love is we're going to a multipolar model, a distributed model of innovation, which everybody can participate in. And you know what? This is good for the world because we need every entrepreneur joining the fight. And guys like Kylie and I are finding them regardless of where they are. It's the ultimate financial inclusion. And so if you're a sovereign wealth fund and you're going, oh, I'm just going to park my money in real estate in New York or London. Uh, yes, that may be a good thing, but I don't know if you're how much value you're really you know, creating. Uh, you, you, you know, I mean, yeah, you need a little bit about that. But, you know, when you talk about VC, all you need are the sovereign wealth funds, particularly in Asia, to shift one or two percentage points. And you're talking about hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars that can go to capital starved entrepreneurs in your own country who can create jobs. Why are you keeping real estate agents in New York and London busy making commissions? They don't need it. And again, this is something I always hear about the Middle Eastern investors as well. I think that time is changing. I, I really do. And um, I think that's good. Cheryl, I know we're running into time here, but can I, is, is this the last yeah, yeah, word yeah. right now? Or? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I just want to be sensitive of... Oh, the uh, I think for um, I think to, your, to land right on the final point about um, having sovereign wealth funds make the case. I, a lot of them who have already started investing in VC and certainly those who have invested in our funds, like it's just a small part of the portfolio. It's it's not the whole portfolio that's shifting, right? So any smart portfolio manager would see like that. And I think the terminology on risk capital it, that's that's wrong terminology. That's points that uh, uh, Tom has made. What it is is growth capital. A lot of sovereign wealth funds are being demanded by their uh, governments to maintain a rate of growth that using the existing portfolio they have is not sustainable. They need to augment it with the times and where value is being created. So if the world's smartest people are just gravitating to startup environments, like you got to follow the money. You know, those smart folks are going to figure it out. And I would say that we're very proud that now we've been around for now 11 years, 500 Global has been around for 11 years, and we get to see the first generation of our funds hit towards year seven and year 10. And we're looking at returns profiles trending between 5X to 10X. We're having these kind of conversations with our early backers, and they're like, oh, I wish we put more money in that. We're like, no, it's not too late because we've done the research on the future markets. We call it the rise of the next. There, it, we've taken multiple research that other people have done about just demographics all over the world. And there is this bucket of companies, of, of countries, which are underinvested, amazing demographics, 
young people, super connected, smartphone connected, but not many VCs are investing in them. So our, for our next decade, we'll be defined by the rise of the next. And we were very fortunate when we, we, when we did that research, we saw that we've already gotten a head start in some of these markets. Some of the markets are in Southeast Asia. Some of the markets are, are in the Middle East. And we had one country in particular that will be a big one in 10 years is Turkey. Like we had an Istanbul fund for five years ago, right? So we got a head start in some of these, but there's some new ones we're going to get into. So for anyone who's looking for opportunity that is well-researched and well-proven, look for the folks who have been it for many years, work with those folks, work with, we'd love to work with you if you feel the same, if you've got shared values and shared vision and you're in it to play like 10, 20, 30 year game, like let's talk about this. It's rare to have that type of horizon and that research and data and thoughtfulness behind it. But when you have it, it's like magic. And that really defines the texture of our lives. It's like meeting the one, right? <laughs> that you stay together with for a long time, right? So I think with that, MathCap, like, we love you very much. Like, if it wasn't for MathCap, really, right? If it wasn't for your early conviction in VCs like us, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. Malaysia wouldn't have any unicorns, right? But because you did, you're going to financially benefit and the country is going to benefit big time. Like, you're the early movers. You're the opening chess move, right? And you're the power move that the country needed and you made that move, right? So thank you so much again. Thanks so much for having 500 Global as part of this as well, right? So thank you so much. Uh, okay, and now I'm open the floor for Q&A, uh, physical, okay? Rafiza, I give the honor to Rafiza. Hi, Kylie and Thomas. Hey. Hi. Um, Kylie, just to add to your point, right, about sharing data and stuff like that. And, and you know, I came from Saim Dhabi and we attempted to um, to do CVCs and stuff like that. I think the issue that a lot of the corporates have because traditionally, you know, their CF only knows um, investments that are more, uh, what they call it, uh, mature, you know, things are public listed, more, you know, the, the types of investments where it's easily to get uh, information. Uh, whereas, as you know, startups, it, it's getting information is like getting blood out of, a, out of the stone. Um, and I think one of the things that, and, and unlike VCs where, you know, you and Thomas, you are all part owners of the, you know, of your, of your VC. Most corporates, right, the senior management, the decision makers, the CEOs, they are on a three-year contract. And mm. so their investment horizon is a lot shorter. They want to they wanna see results within two, three years, which is very, very difficult, you know, for investment in VC. Whereas uh, what they don't want is they start investing in these VCs and then the next CEOs that comes in and six years later, you know, get the credit. So I think that's the issue that we have. But if, you know, the VC world can share on your, how do you, you know, the milestones that you reach through that seven year, nine year horizon, then at least it's something that they can probably, e you know, easy to convince their board of directors who are probably also on a three contract that look, um, you know, yes, this investment takes six, six, seven years, eight years, but if we reach three year within a certain, you know, X number of multiples or whatever, it is considered to be a thing. And I think this is one of the things which, I don't know, the, you know, you guys VC who have, all the knowledge and know-how and skills on the you know life cycle of uh, a fund could perhaps share with the corporates uh, because those are like you know trade secrets and uh, you know things like that. So yeah, uh, can I have your views, please? Thanks. Tom, you want to go first? Boy, boy, th there's a there's a lot to unpack there. Yeah, Rafiza dropped the bomb on us. Oh, whoa. Boom. So um, you, you know, Rafiz, I think, you know, what, what you're really talking about is, you know, there's a bigger, there's a longer term issue, which is, again, you know, uh, publicly listed companies are supposed to be thinking long term. Uh, but in reality, uh, they're, they're, unfortunately, they're judged on a quarterly basis, so very short term. So, 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 so the, the issue you're really talking about is, you know, how do you reconcile short term quarterly demands to show results versus long-term strategies, right, which a VC early, especially early stage demands. I, I'm not quite sure I know the answer to that. I, I know the institutional investors are also supposed to be long-term, but many times they're dictated by short-term horizons, 
So yes, there is often a mismatch in, in, in timing. But I think public markets now are starting to realize, and I, I give a great example, and I think Kylie knows about this as well, is there's a company in Thailand called SCB, Siam Commercial Bank. And they recently have repositioned themselves. They said, you know, we're no longer a bank. We're renaming ourselves SCBX. We're actually a technology company that just happens to own a bank. And the market, the equity markets went crazy. I think they're, they're, uh, they're don't quote me on this. I, I just remember something. I think their market capitalization went up a billion dollars US in a day. So, what you're talking about is again it, it takes not only it's not only us educating the corporates but it's the entire market right uh realizing that you you know everybody says they're long term you got to be investing into the future but people have to actually align with that and i think the market is starting to realize because if you're not investing into the future you're gonna get not only left behind you could get wiped out and, and so i think slowly the big publicly traded equity fund managers are starting to attach a premium now. In the past, if you were saying you're doing VC, they would say, oh, you're unfocused, you're not sticking to your core businesses. I think that's starting to shift. And, and uh, again, with every success that comes out, uh, uh, more people are going to realize that this is not a nice to have, it's a must have. And um, again, it, it's something that we're seeing companies now start shifting from their R&D budgets. Right. Instead of making a, a loss center, if you set up a CVC, you're not only getting access to cutting edge innovation, but it can also be a profit generation center. Right. And, and, and this is what is changing. And, and, and again, uh, you know, this is something people have been talking about years ago. It's just that corporates, especially publicly listed ones, they're under so much pressure to meet a short term horizon, the demands of public fund managers, you know, sometimes you get that mismatch. So it's going to take an entire industry wide shift, but it's happening. Uh, I'm going to share I, it's, that is huge, huge momentum behind what um, Tom is saying. It's like it's really what's happening in real world. Very well articulated as well. Um, I'm going to add a different uh, I'm going to additional perspective, which may be controversial to say, but I'm just going to go for it. Right. Most for it, man. of the folks yeah most rafiza a lot of the folks you're talking about the ceos as well as the kind of senior management members of those companies like those are usually the kind of like people who don't take career risks in the first place and so the result they'll get from their career and their lives when they look back on their cvs and you know and then look at what they've achieved in their life they, they may feel unfulfilled later They'll, they'll be watching Netflix or some movie somewhere and, and wish they, they could have lived vicariously through some kind of risk-taking and just been doing something epic, you know? Like doing something you believe was right, even though the world said it was wrong. Like something you've championed something, right? So there's going to be a whole legion of losers. I'll, I'll tell you that. Because the, in the education system, I can't expect everyone to graduate from class with straight A's. Like some people are just not going to make it. Like how many companies have died in the past 100 years? It's not the past 10 years. How many of them have shut down? How many public listed companies are irrelevant? 10 years ago, they were like, oh, this and that, this and that. You know, they're totally irrelevant right now. Like, this is just brutal truth. You know, I, I don't know how to phrase it better, more delightfully for everyone here, but there's going to be a crop of companies and countries who will not even understand any of this. And I feel like a duty for us, for Tom, myself, and other venture capital folks, and all of us to keep singing this song because we don't want anyone to be left behind. Now, the last thing I'll say about that is that I don't want to, we need, we need to hold the owners of the company accountable. So a lot of public listed companies that you look at the cap table of those companies, like who are the larger owners? This is shareholder activism to some degree, right? A lot of them are owned by pensions. A lot of them are owned by sovereign wealth funds. So we, it's back to the sovereign wealth funds again. You can't expect like Sam Darby or anybody else to like, oh, let's just transform ourselves into a SCBX overnight. Like that push has to come top down. Leaders got to do their job as well. So who wants to be part of a growth story? This is the journey that you have to embrace. Plain and simple. Hey, Kylie, that was so well said. And I just want to add to that. So Rafiza, I think when you look at the profile of companies that are the early movers, and this ties in exactly to Kylie's point, 
A lot of them, surprisingly, are the family-owned businesses where there's a strong shareholder. And they're transitioning the second generation. It's the most open-minded founders. They're listening to what the second or third generation is telling them. And because they have vested interests, they think across generations and they think in terms of decades, not meeting the quarterly report and taking the safe job because they are just hired. Those are the ones we're seeing moving now. And those are the ones that are gonna become the winners. And if you're a family business, large, and you're thinking about it, you're the ones. And if you're second or third generation and you're seeing this right now, I'm telling you, Gobi, we've advised many of these groups. It is absolutely the right thing you need to be doing, as Kylie was saying, to future-proof yourself and stay relevant. I'm telling you, this digital transformation that's coming is going to be an extinction-level event for a lot of the corporates who don't get with the program. Hey, uh, <laughs> any more question from the floor? Okay. So, uh, hi guys, really great session that you shared with us here today. Uh, the question, I'm, I'm Ben, the MC, and I spoke to you guys a little bit before. <laughs> Whoa, but, what's up, uh, Ben? <laughs> yeah, hi, how's it going? Oh, which I'm looking at the camera. No, but, um, you guys spoke about, what, what, one thing that we've been doing here for the uh, events the last few days, we've been hashtagging a lot of our sessions. And in terms of the, when I say hashtag, you know, it's a key learning when we look back at the video, when we look back at the photograph of this session, which has been a great session. but. You guys have mentioned the word cookies a lot. <laughs> okay, and the first thing, and yeah, I mean, I'm not hungry, but I mean, I'm a, we, we are all hungry for success, entrepreneurship and startup wise, but you said, uh, Thomas, I mean, this question is uh, for Thomas and Kylie, if you wanna share, please do. But you said a lot of the success sometimes usually comes from the fourth train of cookies. And most people give up on the second train of cookies. And we all know that entrepreneurship and start, startup is a long-term game. And you know, like, and we always talk about in these kind of forums when I, I mean, we moderate, we MC, we come together, whatever, virtually. We always talk about the grit, determination. You know, like Kyle was saying, don't stay in that safe job the way you have to do quarterly reports and all that sort of stuff. Be bold, be brave, and all of the above, which is which is very inspirational to hear. But it's a bit uh, sometimes for some people, it's quite difficult. So, what's your your view in terms of? I mean, it, it, and the, the other thing that I thought about when you guys said cookies is that who stole the cookie from the cookie jar? Okay, is it, because, is it because people are taking shortcuts and saying, oh, I'll give up on that second track of cookies? And why are they giving up and, you know, and trying to take shortcuts? Are they taking shortcuts? And what's your advice for those people to not take shortcuts and to wait at fourth train? <laughs> I, 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 lost, I lost myself at the cookie and the tray and the jar and cookie monster and you know, data protection under cookies and whether you accept all the cookies or not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm lost on that. So let's, let's put that aside for a moment. I'll answer one part of your question though, I think cause, because behind everything you just said, I think it's something quite interesting. Um, I would say that like, it doesn't have to be so binary. Like a lot of what we're talking about here, you know, we, we try to get a point across. So it's, so it's good to dramatize and illustrate it in extremes. But for the most part, any corporation or fund or family we're not asking it to be a different thing overnight once again, right? Like it, it's not about just having a bunch of cookies in the cookie jar. You're like cooking all kinds of stuff in the kitchen all the time, right? But just get involved in venture. Just get started in venture. It doesn't have to be a totally different thing. And for the people who work in corporations, start engaging and getting these conversations going. Don't be afraid of it, right? Find the other like minds within the firm, within the corporation that are ready to do it. Like if Pet look for Malaysians who are listening in, if Petronas can do it, they're like one of the biggest companies. They've been around the longest, and the way they attacked it and formulated a strategy and found the right partners and activated that, it's like it it feels like overnight. So talk to them, right? So I think that a lot of people have done it, and it's not as daunting as people think. The main thing is just once you start doing it, once you start getting involved, and you just put some money here and there and just get it moving, like you're gonna start to get the hang of it, and it's gonna be a fun ride. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, Ben, I think, uh, you know, I think behind the question, maybe I'll just say a couple of things. I, I think your, your first question is, um, look, the whole entrepreneurship journey is supposed to be hard. Okay, let, let, let's, let's not 
you know, let's just call a spade a spade. I think, you know, one of the things that makes us, uh, you know, why we're having this discussion is because VC is in the headlines and there's a, there's a proliferation now of media that really make it seem uh, this is, you know, it's easy. And look, it, it's never been a better time to be an entrepreneur than now, right? With all the programs, uh, the support systems, incubation, accelerators, like what 500 is doing, they're really kind of providing a lot of support. And when you look at, again, I'm an older guy here, but when I started, none of this was available. I mean, entrepreneurs were going out there and they, they don't have half the support they have now. Okay. But it's supposed to be hard. Okay, and, and I think sometimes when we read the headlines, you just read about the successes. Right, and I, I know Kylie will agree with this. Look, first of all, what we do in the venture business, and again, Gobi's, you know, we're about to celebrate our 20th year anniversary next year. Okay, so we've been doing this a long time. But well, what I would say, uh, first off is, you, you know, behind all the success stories you see, there's a lot of failures. We're, we're, we're in a business where a 90% failure rate is considered good. Could you imagine that? Any other industry, if you were a doctor and, and you had a 90% failure rate, you, you're, you, you're losing your license. In our industry, that's good because it's supposed to be hard. Okay, and, and I just remember like, uh, you know, Kylie and I, we backed a company called Carson, Eric Chang. He's the first unicorn out of Malaysia. He's celebrated. He feels a lot of pressure. He's got the weight of an entire nation on his shoulders. But people are like, wow, Eric, you're an overnight success. No way. You, most people have not seen the sleepless nights, right? Uh, the challenges he had to go through, the failure after failure. Nobody sees that. So it's supposed to be hard. So if I, could, if I could deliver one message to all the entrepreneurs out there, if you're at your low point and you're like, man, I don't know um, if I can go on, that's the whole point. The journey is supposed to be hard because if it were easy, everybody would be doing it. Okay, it is also, as Kylie was saying, I think one thing I hope you're getting is there's also almost like a, a, a spiritual element to this whole thing it's a process that you have to go through you know so i always laugh you're like yeah eric's an overnight success it took him 10 years to become an overnight success people forget all the work and it's true for every entrepreneur and so let me let me let me leave you with one final thing i think what kylie and i both are saying is look a smart person will learn from personal experience the truly wise learn from history Kylie and I and Mavcap, we've accumulated a lot of history. Our job is to guide the truly wise so you don't have to make the same mistakes. We can together make new mistakes, but you don't have to make the same ones. We've already been there. But again, it takes a truly wise person to not have to want to learn that from experience and can rely on history of others. And so maybe that's a thought I'll just... I'll leave everybody with. Okay, we are already at the tail end of the session. I think any last word from you guys regarding Malaysia, the gateway to a to ASEAN. Uh, you know, we we you know we delve deeper into sovereign wealth fund and whatnot. I think one of the key takeaway that I can think of of the calf, BC is actually not a risk capital. It's actually a smart money. Whereby people like you, my GPs, <laughs> putting money smartly into entrepreneur and the business. That would be my one-liner in terms of VC. It's actually a smart money, not a risk capital. I leave both of you another two to three minutes to, to, to give your parting words. Okay, guys, off to you. I think, first of all, I, uh, thanks everybody for listening in. I think it's been a, it's, it's been a spirited and I, and I think it's been a great panel. I always enjoy being with Kylie and, and Sharil. You're, you're, you're fantastic. I think if I were to just leave a, a, everybody with a thought, I, I, I would say, I'm going to leave everybody with a question. Ready? You know, when, what's the best time to invest into a unicorn? 10 years ago. What's the second best time to invest into a unicorn? Now. Now. 
That's all right. So let's get it done. I love that. I love that. Leaving of a question. Um, I think just reflecting on all of this, right? And I love it that, Tom, you brought us to a spiritual level on this. You know, at, at, at 500 Global, uh, a lot of us who work at 500 Global, this is the longest job I've ever had in my entire life. You know, and, and the executive team, we work together between seven to 10 years. It's a game we like to play. So any game that you like to play in your lifetime, with your careers, with how you want to guide the future of your corporations, your companies, the funds you're managing, you're choosing your adventure. That's the fun part. So what kind of game do you want to play? You're watching in media the success of everybody else and how different strategies engineer more reliable ways to repeat that success. If that stuff is fun to you and you want your career and your life to be defined by leaning into this, then choose the game. Choose the game. It will come with its hardships. It will come with its learning things. Definitely learn from each other, I think, to, to the earlier points there. So what game would you like to play? With that, like I hope everyone who is tuning in to this panel look at Malaysia as an opportunity to play games with the people who have shared values as, as yourself, with a shared vision for the world, a shared vision for collaboration between different nations, and to be able to leverage the, the history right, and experience of each other to be able to succeed at playing the games that you want to play. Okay, guys, thanks. Over to you, Ben. Thanks very much, Cheryl. Thanks very much, Kylie and Thomas. Uh, physically, let's give them a big round of applause. As I said before, the session was going to be inspirational, informative, but also extremely comical. These two guys, these two guys are better than Jimmy Fallon. He, okay. he started the I'm cookie thing, okay? Like he started Fallon. the cookie thing. I... Okay. <laughs> you know, so, so my invitation. In, in the spirit of entrepreneurship, both of you, my invitation still stands to come on my show, Great People TV, to talk about great success stories. It's not about a pitch or anything like that. It's just about conversation and, and cookies. And thank you, Rafisa, because you know what, guys? I've got to share this with you. And don't laugh at me, okay? Because I know, Kylie, you laughed at me just now hard. Okay, I'm, but I'm the, la the last two days, we've learned about the word. Everything almost begins with C with all our panel of speakers. There was challenge. There was Cheryl Go. Okay, that's CG. But Cheryl Go from Grab sharing some antidotes there about communication and connectivity. But the lesson that we learned from this session is that because the topic is about, you know, the gateway to ASEAN. So to all of you, especially watching, these two gentlemen have said, or these three gentlemen have said that it's quite actually simple and practical to come to ASEAN or to Malaysia to get those conversations going with other parts of the world. Because like Thomas said, language, religion, and all of the above, we can connect to the world. But how do you connect to the world? These two gentlemen said it properly, correctly. You start with a conversation. You start the conversation with a question or questions like they both just did. And in Malaysian style, bring cookies. <laughs> and make sure they're sweet because when something is sweet, makes people smile. Makes people smile, they'll invest. So ladies and gentlemen, it's been a great session. Let's give our panel another round of applause. A virtual round of applause as well. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks, Kylie. Thanks, Cheryl. We're just going to take a short break, everybody. But when we come back, Cheryl's going to moderate one last session. The topic is when the only option was to win experience sharing of the entrepreneurs. We'll be back very, very soon right here. Dubai Expo 2020. <laughs>